all that break has, has done has enhanced and developed and give it direction. It's not the reason for anything. As much as I love that break and it's in my heart and I use it, it didn't make anything. It just enhanced it. You know, there's a lot of tunes out there. You know, 31 seconds hasn't got a name and break in it from start to finish. Dillinger did tunes without it. Shadow boxing, you know, if I'm just quoting you and giving you examples so people just don't go away and think this is some pro Eamon hype. Okay, fair enough. I do agree with him. There are other breaks out there, but the story is nowhere near as good. Where do we go next after drum and bass? Thinking where the fans shaking hands Dirty morning dog clumping us Little wonders Well, from David Bowie to car commercials, seems like everyone wanted a piece of the Amen action. But there are some producers that favoured a more extreme sound. Equinox's Acid Rain, the Breakage Remix. There was absolutely not another Eamon track I've heard that has, well, ripped it to shreds like that. Just absolutely turned it inside out. On the break course scene, the Eamon break was sped up, mashed up and taken to another level. And if you don't already know, break court sounds a bit like this. Luke Fiber, the man of many aliases, even put out a series of 12s under the name of Amen Andrews. I didn't bother making jungle for a while and then maybe early 2000s or 2003 or something started again but really different just sort of more like stupid rave style a bit uh, childish almost or whatever I was just making them to play out kind of end of the night a bit more crazy than the average track so I just came up with that name being slightly silly with the old Irish TV presenter Amen Andrews and in fact I think every track had Amen break in it Fiber, under the name of Amen Andrews. 
but maybe one of the most hardcore Amen followers is based in Germany, where the break became part of a protest against the rise of neo-Nazis. My name is Alec Empire from Atari Teenage Riot. I also uh, have this label called Digital Hardcore Recordings. There was a rule uh, when we started the label that on every record somebody has to do something with that beat. When you reach your peak, it's time to die. And people always looked at me and were like, can we really do that? I'm like, yeah, of course we can. You know, we must actually do that. By the time like 1995, uh, happened. Uh, we were doing these these things with that beat, where it was just very science, like science fiction. <laughs> it's, you know, a lot of people went like, "Oh my god! Like, how much can you push uh, something further into the future?" It was amazing. I did a record called Suicide with a large E in the middle instead of the I, <laughs> which was sort of like uh, my hate relationship with the rave crowd at the time because I felt they were not thinking political enough and it was sort of escapism while a lot of racism was growing in, in, in the reunified Germany at the time. There were like people rioting on the dance floor. It was like. What are you guys doing? Where's the four to the four black bass drum? You know, it was like, we're like, yeah, we're not gonna give it to you. <laughs> this sounds to us like marching music from the German troops or something. No, we, we, we go back to funk. It also had that uh, pretty legendary track called Hunt Down and Kill the Nazis, you know, which caused a big discussion. Can rave music be political? Should DJs speak out against racism in such an extreme way? But uh, there was so much violence going on that we thought just throwing a party, uh, <laughs> you know, wouldn't solve the problem. We have to address this. Uh, we have to confront those people. <laughs> it's still being played at demonstrations over here <laughs> from the anti-fascist action and stuff. It's uh, pretty amazing how that... Uh, still uh, uh, is such a kind of key track for many people. I remember reading an article which was the most obscure thing I probably ever read in a, in a neo-Nazi magazine. Uh, somebody showed it to me uh, where they went on and on about they put us on this blacklist and we should be killed and attacked and or put in prison and it all went back to that basically by to using that beat and it, I was like oh my god you know like some of these people <laughs> This is the story of the Amen Break with me, Chrissy Chris. BBC Radio 1 Extra Story. We found out where the Amen Break came from and how it surfaced again and again in various different genres of music. But what's the fascination with the break itself? Why are producers so hooked on it? It's always had like a kind of an aura around it. Well, nothing sounds anything like the Amen. The particular take on that day, the way the microphones were set on the drums, it just came out perfect. What I love about it is the dynamics of it. It's like a hissy, cymbally sort of top into it. The funky sort of rolling flow, the way it's been mixed and everything, it's just beautiful. If you're making a tune and like you're stuck and it's not sounding right, all you have to do is put an Amen break in it and then sort it right out. <laughs> If you really want to get that real old euphoric, let's smash the dance floor to pieces kind of vibe, you cannot beat the aim and break. It's pure filth, it's totally saturated, but it seems to work. It's got all the bits you want, like a single kick, a ride, a snare, kind of little mid bits, a great big splash with the kick, and it's really tight. Lots of people have tried to recreate it. The way they played it is a one-off, if you will, and it's been hard to uh, replicate it since. The second or third kick drum before the second snare is in a real awkward place. It's difficult to get the same energy. I go to sleep dreaming yeah, of it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 